Hi, everybody. I want to uh, do a little Come Follow Me this week. We're in 3rd Nephi, chapter 17, 18, and 19, just three chapters this week. So let's have a little fun with this. A little background with this. If you recall, Jesus has appeared to the Americas. He's here uh, gathering around a, a temple in uh, the land of Bountiful. So let's take a look at a few things here. Chapter 17, go to verse 2. Notice the people, they don't understand. Now, they've heard the words straight from the Savior's mouth, but they don't understand. So there's some things we can learn from this. One, hearing and even knowing does not equate understanding. It's possible that I could have had many of math teachers showed me how to do something, taught me the steps. I probably could even follow the steps, but I really didn't understand anything about them. That's apparently is what's going on here. So verse 3, the Savior says, I perceive that ye are weak, that ye cannot understand all my words, which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. Verse 3, therefore go ye unto your homes and ponder upon the things which I have said. So I think there's a powerful lesson in here, is the Savior's meeting with them. They're with him, and he sends them home. So even if we're at church and we learn everything about forgiveness or charity or kindness or all of those wonderful Christ-like attributes that we're supposed to develop, we really don't understand them until we go home and try to live them. I really don't think I'll ever understand forgiveness by talking in a church meeting or listening to a Sunday school lesson or participating in a group discussion. It's not until I go home and practice that attribute with my family. I think there's some truth with probably most gospel principles. They're best learned in the home. So verse 6, uh, let's take a look at a couple of gospel principles, Christ-like attributes that are in here that he specifically talks about and is mentioned in the, re in the records here. Verse 6, my bowels are filled with compassion towards you. Compassion is an interesting attribute of the Savior. I think if you want to have a, a deep study, because uh, there's only three chapters this week. If you just read one a, a day, you only have three days. So you have four days to study. So what can we study? Maybe do a a gospel library search for compassion. You can find some general conference talks. Look up all the times the word compassion is used in the scriptures. And maybe ask, where do I see the Savior uh, being filled with compassion in the scriptures? There's some great things in here. So what does he do? He brings all of the sick before him. Now remember, he's already had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with everybody at the temple. At the very beginning, they came forth and they were able to fill his prints in his hands and in his side and in his feet. But here he's now doing a one-on-one -on -one with just the sick and the lame and the blind and so forth. Anyone who has some form of a need for the Savior to touch him. That's all verse 7. So verse 7, another Christ-like attribute is mentioned at the very end. He says, my bowels are filled with mercy. Again, study the topic mercy. That, that, what a great topic. And verse 8, it's not Jesus that's healing them. He tells them very clearly, your faith is sufficient that I should heal you. So it's, I, I guess you can count both in there, but it's their faith. Think of how many times in the New Testament, Jesus said, thy faith hath made thee whole. He would give a blessing, and it's based upon their faith and so forth. Some great things in there. So in, enjoy that study in there. So go to verse 9. Uh, this is where everyone gathers that's sick and so forth, and they're brought and they're healed. Uh, 10, what do they do? They worship. They kneel at his feet. They kiss his feet. It even says his feet are just wet with the tears that have been fallen upon them. So verse 11, what's next? Okay, everyone's had a witness to be able to come and touch and feel the prince of the Savior and hear him. He's called his apostles. He's brought now all the sick. But here in verse 11, he's asking for all the little children. He's reaching out to the primary. 
And what do they do? In verse 10, they kneel down before him. Verse 14, they kneel down. And here's something interesting. Uh, this story just is interesting. He gathers the little children around him. And then what does he do? Uh, verse 14, Jesus groaned within himself and said, Father, I am troubled because of the wickedness of the people of the house of Israel. So he brings all the little children before him. And what does he feel? He feels troubled because the house of Israel is so wicked. And it's just feeling and being with these little kids, he's feeling the wickedness of the world around him. Now, verse 17, what was said, we don't know. It tells us that no tongue can speak, neither can there be written. But we know in verse 21 that he wept and he blessed the children one by one. So we now, this is at least our third time where he's taken people in a one-on-one -on -one experience with him. 24, we know that the angels came and encircled them about, and verse 25 tells us how many people are there. Men, women, and children, about 2,500. So in current day terminology, that's about a stake. That, that's a, 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 roughly a stake uh, full of people, women, children, and they're all there with the Savior. Now, let's go to chapter 18. Verse 1. He sends the disciples to go get bread and wine. And verse 12, they sit down with him, and he, Jesus, takes the bread and breaks it and so forth, and he commanded that they should eat. So here is a sacrament going on. And not only do the disciples eat, but the whole multitude gets to eat. And then notice verse 5 here. Verse 5 says, And when the multitude had eaten and were filled, he said unto the disciples, Behold, there shall be one ordained among you, and to him will I give power, that he shall break bread. In other words, he has his 12 disciples there, but he tells those 12 that only one of you is going to have all of the keys and the authority. And then he tells them, you're going to observe this. Verse 7, verse seven. then ye shall remember my body. And so maybe this week, if you can still take the sacrament at home, if you still have that opportunity, have a special sacrament meeting at home and read these verses where it talks about the body of Jesus Christ. That think, look how many times the word remember and observe is to do that, and witness and willing, remembrance. I mean, these are some powerful words that are all in there. So if we also notice here, he's talking just to his disciples at this moment. So let's go to verse 15. He tells them, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must watch and pray. Always, that's like Doctrine and Covenant section 10, verse 5, pray always, lest ye be tempted by the devil, and ye be led away captive by him. Notice, watching and praying, temptive, there's temptation, there's a whole great list of things to study in here. Uh, and I think probably the most, I don't know, maybe overlooked or... It's a repeated theme in these three chapters is prayer. I mean, how many times does the Savior prayer and command them to pray? In this case, he's talking to just his disciples, because you'll feel notice in verse 17, in the middle of 17, he turned again unto the multitude and said unto them, Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must watch and pray always, lest ye enter into temptation. So he's telling his 12 disciples you better be praying often because you're going to be tempted. And then he turns to the multitude. You need to be praying and watching always, or you're going to be tempted. For Satan desireth to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's all verse 18. And then he commands them to pray. Verse 21, pray in your families. And 22, ye shall meet together oft, and ye shall not forbid any man from coming unto you when ye shall meet together. So there's some great things in here, some great things. I hope you enjoy studying these things. And then if we go to the end here, 
verse 36. And it came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of saying these things, he touched with his hand his disciples, whom he had chosen one by one, even until he had touched them all. So here is his fourth time where he's touching people one by one. In this case, it's just his disciples, those 12 disciples that they they name. He one by one, and he gives them power. That's verse 37. And verse 38, and it came to pass that when Jesus had touched them all, he there came a cloud and overshadowed the multitude that they could not see Jesus. Verse 39, and while they were overshadowed, he departed from them and ascended into heaven. And the disciples saw and bear record. So notice, the multitude doesn't see Jesus uh, leave. Only the 12 disciples do because of the cloud that overshadows all of them. But then the Savior leaves. So when we go to chapter 19, the Savior's gone. So what does everyone do? Exactly what he asked them to do in the first place. Verse 1, they went home. They went home. And what are they doing? Well, unlike today, maybe we're a little worried about, I don't want to go out and preach. I don't want to be preachful. I don't want to do missionary work. People might. Yeah, nobody's afraid of doing missionary work at this time. Verse 3 says, Yea, and even all the night it was noised abroad concerning Jesus. They're telling everybody their testimony of him. And on the morrow, the multitude is there, and it is large. Verse 4 names names of the 12 apostles, starting with Nephi, who is the leader. And his brother names him by name, the one that he raised from the dead. So there's some neat things in there. What are they doing in verse 5? The group is so big, they divide the group up into 12s, and each of the disciples will take one of the 12 groups, and they will teach them. They'll share their testimony, their witness, because they have had some special meetings with the Savior. Not so indifferent. Sometimes our church leaders have special meetings and conferences and workshops, and then they come back and they teach us what they've learned and what they felt. And I hope you do that as a family. I hope when mom comes back from a Relief Society meeting or dad comes back from Elders Quorum, I hope they gather the family around and say, let me teach you what I learned. Don't let that great experience be lost. Share that with people. Maybe grandparents share it with grandkids. Say, let me tell you about my experience. And that's what they do. So verse 11 through 14 now is there's a special baptism going on of just the disciples. Nephi's first. He gets baptized. Then he baptizes the others. The Holy Ghost comes upon them. They are in verse 14. They were encircled about as if as if it were by fire. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience here. Then in verse 15, the Savior comes again and stood in the midst uh, and ministered unto them. Neat things. Now, in verse 16, he's going to turn to the multitude, and he commands them that they should kneel down upon the earth. So, and what does he do? I think it's interesting. Jesus shows up, and then he leaves the group, but they can still see him. He goes off on his own. And what does he do? He prays. And then he commands everyone else to pray. So this is a great chapter to discuss prayer. And notice what and how and why the Savior prays here. He does this again. He prays alone again. That's in verse 20, oh, what is that, 27? So he's with the group. Then he leaves and he prays. He's setting such a powerful precedent of prayer. Remember, we're assuming at this time he's ascending up to his father where he's with him, but now he's on earth. What does he do? He prays to the father. And so should we often. I just love that. So to conclude, and no one knows the words of the prayers, or at least they cannot be written is what it says in verse 34. Neither can they be uttered by man. But there are some great things in there, and the Savior himself is going to declare such great faith amongst these people. And we will uh, conclude here. So next week, we will look at chapters 20 through 26. So enjoy some uh, reading and studying in these three chapters about the Savior, his attributes, uh, prayer, and anything else that you feel impressed to learn. And we'll see you next week.